Hi everyone, my name is Faustine Ramirez and I'm a master tutor with Med School Coach. And today we'll be reviewing a Step 2 CK OB question. So let's start by reading the stem and pay attention here because I'd like you to work through this question on your own first and it runs over two slides. So let's start by reading a 30 year old Gravita 2 pair of one woman at 39 weeks gestation is admitted to the hospital in labor. She received good prenatal care throughout the pregnancy. She was admitted to the hospital for pyelonephritis in the second trimester, which was treated with IV antibiotics. She was GBS positive in her prior pregnancy, which was otherwise uncomplicated. Upon arrival, she endorses regularly, moderately painful contractions occurring every three to five minutes. Temperature is 37.7 Celsius, heart rate is 102, respiratory rate is 20, and blood pressure is 92 over 60. The cervix is 100% effaced and five centimeters dilated, and the vertex is at zero station. She has spontaneous rupture of membranes, and the amniotic fluid is stained with thick meconium. The fetal heart tracing is shown here. So pause the video for a moment, make sure you've gathered all the important information from this slide before we move forward. All right, so the fetal heart tracing is shown here. And the question is, what is the most appropriate next step? So I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and try to work through this question on your own first. All right, welcome back. So let's approach this question together. The first step is going to be to read the question itself, so the very last sentence of the stem. So what is the appropriate, most appropriate next step? So this is going to be a management question. And we glance at the answer choices very briefly, just takes a few seconds, and we see that they involve antibiotics, um, interventions, procedures, so a lot of different management options. And so the key here will be to identify what's going on in the question stem, what is the diagnosis, and how would we manage it, um, what would be the best next step. So not necessarily looking for all the correct answer choices, but looking for um, the one that we would want to do first. So then we go to the stem and we read from the top and we'll highlight the key elements. A 30-year-old uh, G2P1 woman at 39 weeks gestation is admitted to the hospital in labor. She received good prenatal care throughout the pregnancy. She was admitted to the hospital for pyelonephritis in the second trimester, which was treated with IV antibiotics. She was GBS positive in her prior pregnancy, which was otherwise uncomplicated. Upon arrival, she endorses regular, moderately painful contractions occurring every three to five minutes. Temperature is 37.7 Celsius, heart rate is 102, respiratory rate is 20, and blood pressure is 92 over 60. So I do recommend highlighting any abnormal vital signs. Here, her temperature is um, still within the normal range, maybe slightly higher, um, but not quite a fever yet. Heart rate is 102, respiratory rate is 20, so mild tachycardia and tachypnea. Blood pressure is on the lower end of normal here, 92 over 60. The cervix is 100% effaced and five centimeters dilated, and the vertex is at zero station. So she is having regular contractions every three to five minutes with appropriate cervical change. So her labor is progressing well. And now she has spontaneous rupture of membranes and the amniotic fluid is stained with thick meconium. So if we were to kind of synthesize these findings so far, this is um, a woman who's presenting at term with um, no major complications from the current pregnancy, no major past medical history, who is progressing in labor appropriately with cervical change, with regular contractions, um, and has just ruptured. She does have meconium. And the vital signs here um, are relatively unremarkable for someone who's in labor. Mal tachycardia, mal tachypnea is not surprising for someone who is in pain, who's in labor, and um, the temperature is still within the normal range. The blood pressure is just lower end of normal. So, so far, nothing too abnormal here. Um, and we get to the fetal heart tracing. And so this is really, um, this question is testing your knowledge of how to interpret fetal heart tracings. That stem gave us um, the story for someone with a relatively unremarkable labor course so far, nothing too abnormal that jumped out at us. And it's really gonna be um, hinging upon our interpretation of this fetal heart tracing. So before we even get to the fetal heart tracing, let's cross out a few answers that are just clearly wrong um, based on what we've read in the stem so far. So no intervention is necessary. Um, we're not sure yet because we have to interpret the fetal heart tracing, so we can leave that one. Broad spectrum antibiotics. So looking back at our question stem, 
is there any reason that this woman would need broad spectrum antibiotics? So she's afebrile. We're not told about any um, other signs of infection, right? She doesn't have uterine tenderness. That would be concerning for choreo. She doesn't have, um, you know, foul smelling, purulent amniotic fluid. That would be concerning for choreo. She doesn't have vaginal discharge. Um, she doesn't have any mention of costovertebral angle tenderness. And really, most importantly, she's not febrile and her heart rate is just borderline elevated. Um, but the absence of fever makes us less concerned about um, some fever that she would need antibiotics for. So we can cross off broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, GBS specific antibiotics. Does she need interpartum GBS prophylaxis? And so we go back to the stem and we see that um, she was GBS positive in her prior pregnancy. Um, but we're not told anything about her current GBS status. So if we're not told that it's abnormal, we can assume here that it's, um, it was unremarkable. We were told that otherwise she had good prenatal care, um, otherwise unremarkable besides the pyelonephritis. And so um, we're not told anything about um, having GBS bacteria or GBS UTI in the current pregnancy and remembering our indications for GBS prophylaxis. Um, having GBS infection in the prior pregnancy is not sufficient. It's GBS infection in the neonate. So only um, a GBS neonatal infection in the prior pregnancy is an indication for GBS prophylaxis in the current pregnancy. So make sure to review all of your indications for GBS prophylaxis. So those include um, obviously GBS positive in your third trimester screening. That includes any positive GBS urine culture, whether or not it's symptomatic in the current pregnancy, that includes a prior history of GBS neonatal infection in a prior pregnancy, um, and then also GBS unknown with any number of factors, including preterm, less than 37 weeks, rupture of membranes greater than 18 hours, or interpartum fever. So this woman does not meet any of these criteria for um, current GBS prophylaxis. And so this is really testing your knowledge of the indications for GBS prophylaxis. So make sure you review those. Those are important. Um, next, amniocentesis. So this is used um, in prenatal screening to um, look for any aneuploidies. It's also sometimes used in the diagnosis of chorioamnionitis. But in this case, we have no reason to do an amniocentesis and her membranes have already ruptured. The amniotic fluid has already um, come out. And so we can cross this one out. Packed RBC transfusion. Let's leave that one for now. We might need to interpret the fetal heart tracing first. Same with maternal repositioning, amnio infusion, emergency C-section. Um, none of these um, we can rule out yet until we interpret the fetal heart tracing. Um, potentially the packed RBC transfusion, um, looking at the heart rate, it's not that elevated. It's just a little bit elevated. The blood pressure is um, on the lower end of normal, but it's still um, you know, within the normal range, especially for a pregnant woman, remembering that our blood pressures in pregnancy are slightly on the lower side. And so um, here, there's, we're not told about any massive bleeding or any other cause for her to be bleeding, and she's not that profoundly hypotensive. So I would say um, we can eliminate answer choice E as well. There's no indication here um, for a transfusion. So let's leave A, F, G, and H, and those will depend on our interpretation of the fetal heart tracing. So students often get frightened when they see a fetal heart tracing, but let's learn about the three main types of decelerations, and after this, you should be able to master any question on a fetal heart tracing. So let's start by looking at the different types of decelerations. So there are three main types of decelerations. Early, which is shown on the left here, late, which is shown in the top right, and variable, which is shown in the bottom right. So early decelerations occur um, essentially at the same time as a contraction. So at the bottom here, we see the contraction. The top, we see the fetal heart tracing. So the onset of the deceleration occurs at the onset of the contraction. The nadir, so the bottom, most bottom point of the deceleration occurs at the maximal point of contraction. So you see how those correspond um, in, a, in time, right? So the top of the contraction is at the same time as the bottom of the deceleration. And then the um, contraction ends and the recovery of the um, deceleration occurs at the same time as well. So these correspond in time and they are gradual, meaning that they last 30 seconds or more from onset to nadir. So onset is here, nadir is the very bottom point, and that is more than 30 seconds. 
So typically decelerations, um, we're looking for at least 15, a decrease of at least 15 beats in the heart, fetal heart tracing. So it's a dip in the fetal heart tracing that we see. And they can either be gradual or abrupt. And both early and late D cells will be gradual, meaning that they last 30 seconds or more from onset to nadir. But variable D cells will be abrupt in that they are um, quicker onset and quicker offset. So last, less than 30 seconds from onset to nadir. So early decelerations are shown here. And the key thing here is that they're gradual and they correspond in time with the contraction. So as a contraction increases and decreases at the same time, the deceleration dips down and then comes back up again. Late decelerations begin after the maximal point of the contraction. So this is the maximal point of the contraction here. And we see that the onset starts after the maximal point. So after the maximal point, then it dips down and it recovers late as well. So these are gradual, again, lasting 30 seconds or more from onset to nadir. And they consistently will start after the, um, after the maximal point of the contraction. So if you look in time here, the maximal point of the contraction is here and it has an onset right after that. So consistently after the maximal onset. And then finally, variable. These are abrupt in contrast to the other two, and these occur completely independently of the contraction. So both early and late um, are corresponding in time to a certain pattern with the contraction. Here, the D cells can occur um, at any point. They don't correspond in time. They can occur with the contraction. They can occur after the contraction. They can occur in between the contraction. So there's no pattern. So it's a variable time relationship to the contractions and they occur suddenly. So it's these sudden drops as you see here, instead of this slow gradual decrease, it's a sudden drop and then a sudden recovery. Um, and so, so rapid return, they last less than 30 seconds from onset to nadir and there's no time um, correspondence to the contraction. So that's how we would recognize them on fetal heart tracing. Now you also have to not just recognize them but understand what causes them. So this gets tested all the time. Um, this question specifically is about one type of D cell, but you could get questions on any type of D cell and you do need to know what the underlying cause is and how to manage them. So this is a very high yield topic and I can guarantee you'll get a question on a deceleration, if not more than one question on your OB shelf and your CK exam. So early D cells are benign. They indicate head compression. So the fetal head is compressed. Um, they're benign, they don't require any further management. So if there's a question about what to do next, you can just let it be and not do anything about it. Variable D cells indicate some form of cord compression. So that could be due to oligohydramnios. Um, if all the amniotic fluid has um, emptied from the amniotic cavity and you have, or if you just have decreased amniotic fluid like oligo, if the cord has prolapsed and is getting compressed, um, if there's a nuchal cord, so anything that's compressing the cord can cause variable decelerations. And these do have the potential to lead to fetal hypoxia and acidosis, but it depends, the management depends on how many there are. So if they're intermittent, less than 50% of contractions, they're also very well tolerated. There's no further management required. If they're recurrent, occurring with 50% or more of the contractions, you do have to manage these. The first step is going to be maternal repositioning. So the idea here is to position the mom in a way to um, kind of reduce the cord compression by the uterus, remove um, that compression and allow better blood flow to the placenta. In other words, to allow better fetal oxygenation. So you try to reposition the mom and more commonly you'll put the mom in the left lateral decubitus position, you'll relieve the pressure, off of that cord, you'll improve blood flow to the placenta and you'll improve fetal oxygenation. If that doesn't work, then the next step would be fetal amnio, uh, or I'm sorry, would be just amnio infusion. The idea here is you are just putting um, saline into the amniotic cavity to um, relieve the compression of either the fetus um, on the cord. So by putting infusing, in, uh, infusing fluid into that amniotic cavity, you're basically allowing the cord to separate from whatever's compressing it. Um, usually the baby is compressing it. And so um, the fluid allows those structures to kind of separate and it relieves that cord compression and so improves blood flow to the placenta. 
And finally, late D cells. So these are very concerning. Um, these are concerning for uterine placental insufficiency, which can lead very quickly to fetal hypoxia and acidosis. So if you have late decelerations, this is an indication for an emergency C-section. So you should be able to identify what these look like. You should be able to identify what the causes are and what the management is. So going back to our question here, let's interpret this fetal heart tracing. So we already crossed off B, C, D, and E. So we're left with A, F, G, and H. And so you can see that A, no intervention is necessary. This would be the correct answer for an early D cell. Maternal rep or um, variables that are intermittent. Maternal repositioning, this would be the management for um, recurrent variables. This would be the first step. Amnio infusion, this would also be variables but this would be the second step. And then emergency C-section, this would be for late D cells. So we need to interpret this fetal heart tracing, see what type of decelerations there are, and then pick the right answer. So this fetal heart tracing, um, first we look at the fetal heart rate. Um, the baseline is at about 150, 160. So that's the upper limit of normal. Remember normal is 110 to 160. So we're still normal heart rate. We're seeing these dips of at least 15 beats per minute in the fetal heart tracing. And so um, we are seeing these dips that, that are looking pretty sharp, right? They're occurring pretty abruptly and they, they, have, they occur abruptly and they have a rapid um, recovery. So I'm already thinking that this looks more like a variable rather than early or late. And then we look and see whether they correspond to the, to the contraction. So here it occurs right before the contraction. Um, so that's not specifically aligned. Um, we're seeing another one here that occurs in between contractions, right? So here's the maximal point of the contraction. It's occurring in between. Here it's occurring right before. And here it's occurring kind of right before again. And so these are not aligned well with the contractions. And they are abrupt. And they're not associated with the contractions. And so this right here um, is the definition of a variable deceleration. So then we need to decide whether they're intermittent, occurring with less than 50% of contractions, or recurrent, occurring with more than 50% of contractions. And so what we're seeing here is we're seeing one, two, three, four contractions, and we're seeing at least about three decelerations. Um, and we might be seeing more if we were seeing the end, um, the end of the strip here. And so this is occurring with more than 50% of the contractions. So these are recurrent. And so because these are recurrent, we need to do something about them because um, the baby's at risk of developing um, hypoxia and acidosis if we don't do anything. And remembering that the first step for recurrent variables is going to be maternal repositioning. And then if that doesn't work, then you would do the amnio infusion. So the correct answer here is F. So this is a really classic um, step 2 CK question for your OB shelf or your step 2 CK exam where you need to interpret fetal heart tracing. Um, remember what we learned here about identifying them based on those very um, select features that we went over, understanding the causes and understanding the management. And after this, if you understand all of that information, uh, this is high yield, I would review it, but you'll be able to master any question on um, fetal heart tracings after this. So thanks so much for listening and that wraps up our question of the week. Thank you.